Good morning, New Hope Community Church family and friends. Pastor J.E. Catterson here, and I am excited to, that there are people all around the globe that are joining us, and I'm excited to, for those that will be in person uh, at uh, New Hope Community Church in Northport uh, this Sunday morning. But in the meantime, um, I, I cannot tell you how glad I am that 2020 is over. Some of you probably feel the same. And um, if there was ever a time that we needed uh, to uh, hear from God and experience God's signs and wonders, it's in the year 2021. And uh, we're starting a new sermon series called Signs and Wonders, looking at the miracles of Jesus in the Gospel of John. And I want to dive right into uh, John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. Listen to the Word of God. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have, you might, may have life in his name. You may have life in his name, uh, the word of the Lord. Um, I just trust that uh, as we dive into uh, John's gospel, that uh, not only will we be blessed, but we will be given things to actually help us to live out, to have life in his name. So I'm just going to pause and just uh, very quickly to say, Heavenly Father, we ask that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit. And as we have the opportunity to look at this amazing scripture and all the miraculous stories, the miraculous signs that go with it, we trust that, uh, Lord, that if we uh, will have our lives changed as a result. In your name, amen. You know, when we think of the miracles of Jesus in the gospel, there's almost 40 of them that are recorded. Uh, 38 probably to be precise. But the, the gospel writer, John, decides to have seven that he records in the, his, um, his book. And there are seven. And what I'd like us to do is actually... Uh, as a form of introduction to our new sermon series, is to actually look at John 20, 30, and 31 in light of each of those stories. And it's kind of like we're going to do a flyover of the Gospel of John. And when you fly into any city, any city in the state of Florida, uh, whether it's Jacksonville or Miami, if it's Orlando, Tallahassee, Fort Myers, Tampa, where I've lived for the last decade plus, um, when you're flying into Tampa International Airport, you look at certain things that you start to notice. You see, oh, there's New Tampa, or there's Land of Lakes, or oh, there's McDill Air Force Base that I'm going to do. There's, oh, Lithia and Valrico. Now, if you're not from there, that makes no sense to you. Just like for us he, that live here in uh, uh, Port Charlotte and, and Northport in Venice, if you're flying into the Sarasota Airport or the Ponta Gorda, they would be the things that you look for. And so we're going to look at these miracle stories, the miraculous signs and wonders, not in great depth, but to actually look at and have a better understanding of why John included these. He was an urban pastor ministering in the city of Ephesus. And there are people that were there that had questions. I believe there were probably at least seven. And each one of these miraculous signs and wonders answers one of their questions. And the first one is in uh, John chapter 2. And it's a familiar story to many people. It's where Jesus goes and turns the water into wine. And what takes place here is we see it's on the third day of the wedding that Mary is there and Jesus and his disciples, who also were invited, show up. Now, to be honest with you, back in those days, weddings lasted a week. And, uh, you know, and people would have meals all throughout the day. And the normal thing that they would be drinking would be wine. And uh, so as they're drinking wine and they're three days into it, they run out of wine. Well, Jesus was probably part of the problem, uh, you know, not even meaning it tongue in cheek, but he brings 12 thirsty, you know, um, uh, disciples or men with them. And so they run, this young couple is faced with humiliation and embarrassment because they've run out of wine. And Jesus' mother is sensitive to this, as most mothers would be. So she calls her son and says that, you know what? that uh, they uh, have no more wine. And he says, dear woman, uh, you know, why do you involve me? My time has not yet come. Now, I'm not sure about you. I know me. I wouldn't want to speak to my mother that way. But you have to understand the whole context of what Jesus was doing. He's actually trying to set the framework of when his time is to actually reveal that he is the Messiah, that he is the master of all things that are in the created order. 
when we see what takes place is that it, the, the mother didn't, says to those that work in the wedding, do whatever he tells them to do. And we find out that there are six stone jars that are nearby that are filled with water. And these stone jar, jars are 20 to 30 gallons. And Jesus tells them to fill the water all the way to the brim. Then draw out what is in there and take it to the master um, of the banquet. And so they did exactly what he said. And through this, Jesus turns the water into wine. Miraculously, we're going to see this young couple is saved of embarrassment and humiliation. But that's not really the full story of it being the master. There's a theological point that's there, too. You see, to run out of wine in a Jewish wedding meant that the life was gone because wine in the Old Testament and New Testament stood for the good life. It was it was the spirit life. It was the fruit of the vine. And to say that the, to run out of wine at a Jewish wedding was really a theological indictment on the Jewish people of that day, that they, that they had lost their way. They had lost their life. And only Jesus could come and be that new life that they needed. Because remember, John was saying that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of 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 the living God, and that by believing in him, you might have life in his name. And here's the thing. I've lived in a number of cities uh, throughout the globe, and one of the cities I lived in was Edinburgh, Scotland. And each morning, I would leave my apartment flat, my apartment, and there were wine bottles that were all over the, the, the doorstep and, 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 all, and all over the stairs. And you see people that were addicted to alcohol, and they were winos, and they would drink wine, and they would just leave their bodies, and I would have to step over bodies sometimes and pray for people. But you know what? The wine that they drank was cheap wine. It was, you know, it was like, you know, that 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 three, four, five dollar bottle of wine that you get at a, at a grocery store. Not a good bottle of wine. And here is the clue about who Jesus is. As we look at the Jesus and, and the masters of the uh, masters of the miracles that he performed, Jesus' uh, clue is is found in the reply of the wedding banquet host because he goes, "I am a little confused." Most people bring out the good wine first, and when people have got good drunk and don't know any better, then you bring out the cheap wine. But you have saved the best until last. And so that's the clue that Jesus is the master of quality of life, the master of quality. He makes the best wine at a Jewish wedding. He is the one who actually can restore your life. I want you to hold on to, on to that, and let's look at the next miracle story. We're going to take a short short flight as we're flying over, and we look at the, the, the next miracle story, which is in John chapter 4. It's the story of the uh, uh, royal official's son. And we see that Jesus, again, is uh, 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 is there in Galilee, and this, uh, this royal official has a son who's dying. So he takes a two-day journey and treks, uh, leaves his son in Capernaum, and he, and he goes and finds Jesus. When he comes to him, he goes and he asks him to please come with me that my son is sick. And he said, and this text even says that he begged him to come and heal. And Jesus said, unless people get miraculous signs and wonders, they're not going to believe. And so what takes place is he goes and he says, but my son, a father is like my son, please come. And then Jesus says, you may go. Your son will live. And so in faith, this royal official, who's used to giving orders to those that work for him, um, obeys Jesus, and he takes a two-day journey back to see his son and see if what Jesus said is true. And he's met halfway there. He's met by, by people who ran to catch up to him and said, your son is alive. And the, and the, and the royal official said, when did this take place? And, they, and he goes and he sees that it was yesterday afternoon, and they compare sundials. It's a precise time, the exact time that Jesus had spoken the word. See, Jesus is not only a master of quality at a Jewish wedding, making the best wine, being able to restore life. He is the master over all of geography or of distance, that his word can circumnavigate the globe in an instant. It can even circumnavigate two days journey worth of time and, and, and bring about healing. He is the master of geography. He is the master of distance. And then we look, and there's a yet another miracle story that we are going to look at. And we see that it's the third one. And in the third miracle story, it's the story in John chapter 5. It's the miracle of an invalid. And as we look at the text, we see that he has been an invalid for 38 long years. And he was near a, a pool 
that actually when, when the spirit would stir and the waters would be stirred, people would rush down and go into the waters and they'd be healed. And when he encounters Jesus, he said, I have no one to take me down to the pool when the waters are stirred up and I, and I need help. And Jesus tells him, get up, take up your mat and walk. And the text is so explicit. The word that's used here, it says, at once, immediately, the man was healed. See, that's the clue. Jesus is the master of quality. He's the, he is the master of geography and distance, but he's also the master of time. Able to undo in an instant, immediately, what 38 long years had done to this man. The gospel writer Mark loved using that hurry up adverb. Uh, at once, immediately. He used it over and over and over again. But here, John uses that same word. He only uses it here, at once or immediately. And Jesus brings about the, mir the miracle there. There's another miracle story that I don't want you to miss. We see it's the fourth one. And it's one that many people, uh, uh, just it's one of their favorite. Because there's Jesus and he's been out traveling along the Sea of Galilee. And a great multitude gathers. And we see that Philip comes in and says, hey, we got a problem. We got all these people. There's 5,000 men uh, that are here. We know it was men because back then that's what they counted. We know there were women and children as well. So it's probably tens of thousands, but at least 5,000 men are there. And Jesus says, go out to town and get something to eat. And they say, well, wait a minute, Jesus. That would take eight months wages. And But then there's Andrew. Andrew is kind of like... Um, you know, uh, probably like a church treasurer or a, or a bank official. He comes up and, and he says, but what I do have is a little boy with a little lunch. And so Jesus says, bring it to me. And we see that what the, the little boy has, he's got five barley loaves and two small fish. Barley loaves were poor people's bread. And so we know that the boy was poor. And, and the fish is so, you, you can't miss this. Uh, in the original language, we see that actually the Greeks had a, Small word for big fish and a big word for little fish. Now, a small word for big fish is ichthus. And the word that's used, used is not, that's not what's used here. Ichthus is a, is a ginormous fish. And that's the kind of fish later on in the Gospels we see that the nets were, were, were so full that the boat started to sink and they started to tear. But no, this is a big word where we get our word sardine, right? Little sardine, you know, little tiny, hardly could even... There and the barley loaves are like just like kind of like a like a, a crystals or a white castle hamburger. You could barely smell it. So it's this little boy's lunch. But Jesus, as we see, given a kind of a foreshadow to communion or to the Lord's Supper uh, there at, uh, you know, the last supper that he has, the Eucharist. He takes that. He looks to heaven. He blesses it. He breaks it and he get and it, they hand it out. And the text is so explicit. It goes and tells us that as the Jesus do, does this, that what ends up happening is that there were 12 basketfuls that were left over. You see, this is the miracle. Jesus is the master of quantity. Now, the religious leader would say, well, Moses fed us in the wilderness for all those years. But here's the thing. Moses never made leftovers. More than enough. The master of quantity who can provide even leftovers. And you notice there are 12 basketfuls, one for each of those disciples that didn't believe to hold, to bring the show and tell, to reflect upon their, un their unbelief. To, to see, a greater than Moses is here. He is a master of quality at a Jewish wedding. He is the master of geography to heal the official son. He is the master of time to immediately at once heal what 38 years had done to an invalid. Now he's the master that we see of quality and quantity. Then there's another miracle story that I don't want you to miss. As we travel on John uh, to John's gospel, we see there uh, in John chapter 6 as well, uh, the beginning of 6 is the feeding of 5,000. The end of 6 is we see Jesus walking on water. Now, I got to think about the miracles that happen around the water. And it reminds me of another story of Jesus. Remember when he was with the, his disciples and were in a boat? And he falls asleep and there's a big storm. And it's raging and the disciples panic and they wake him up. And what does Jesus do? You'd expect it from a carpenter. He stands up in the boat. But he does something else. He says, be still, be quiet. And the winds and the waves, they heard his voice. He is, he is the God of all creation. 
He is the he is the God of the environment. For all of these things came into being by him. It was a familiar voice, and they obeyed him. And the disciples in that story said, Who is this that even the wind and the wave obey? It means to show me that there are you can actually walk with Jesus, hear his teaching, watch him perform signs and wonders, and still not know who he is. Perhaps those that are listening today and those that are present with us, maybe that's you, that do you actually really know Jesus? Because who is Jesus? He is the master of all creation. He is the master of nature. Here we see in this story that, that Jesus goes and he's and he's walking right on top of the water. And the disciples, are go, again, are absolute panic-stricken. They just could not even believe their eyes. And Jesus says, it is I, do not be afraid. Then they were willing to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the shore that it was heading to. There's another miracle story. It's the sixth one. It's in John chapter 9, and it is the one that tugs at my heart the most. I believe it is the most relevant one that we have for our nation right now, because it is the story of the man born blind. And when we look at the story, we see that, that Jesus went along and a man born blind from birth. And the disciples said, Rabbi, who sinned? This man or his parents that he was born blind. But Jesus said that neither the man nor his parents. But this happened that the work of God might be displayed in his life. He goes, why I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. And having said this, he spit in the ground. And, and, and in the mud with his saliva, he took that saliva and that mud and he stuck it on the man's eyes. And he told him to go to the pool and wash his eyes. And when the man came up from the pool, he miraculously received his sight. Now, notice there's so many things that are going on in this story. First of all, there's a profound theological point that's here. Because they're saying, not how did he become blind? It could have been, I mean, back in those days, his parents could have had syphilis or some other disease. The mom could have been injured while he was in, in, in her womb. There's a lot of ways that he could have been blind. But they weren't asking, you know, you know how blindness. They're saying, why blindness? Why suffering? This miracle, sign and wonder, is about the problem of pain. And our nation is hurting right now. Our community and our church is hurting. And this is a very profound miracle story. Because we see that actually he does that. And people said, this is the man that used to beg and now he's healed? No, it can't be. Maybe we're mistaken. He said, yes, it is I. I once was blind, but now I see. And Jesus told him to go present himself to the religious leaders. And he went and they said, how is this possible? Who is this guy? That did this, and he said he's a prophet, and he put and he, and he put the, he put the his saliva in the mud and put it on my eyes, and I washed, and I was healed. And he said, "Do you want to know more about him?" And they said, "You sinner," and he's a sinner. How could anything good come from this? Now it, it just reminds me again. It's more than that. It's like how does Jesus bring about healing? How do the signs and wonders take place? Because it reminds me of uh, another man. Remember in the other gospel, blind Bartimaeus, who, in, who interrupted a whole processional and parade in Jericho. And blind Bart was calling out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus like, what do you want? I want to see. So Jesus speaks the word and blind Bart is healed. Could you imagine being at First Alliance Church in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago, just after Pentecost, and they're having... Uh, you know, testimony night, talking about miracle stories or the signs and wonders that Jesus did. And we see that blind Bart gets up and, 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 and the man born blind, the man born blind says that Jesus spit in the mud. He put it in my eyes. I went to the pool. I washed and I was healed. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And blind Bart says, I'm a little confused. I don't understand it. Jesus actually just spoke the word and I was healed. You know, that's how Jesus heals. I'm not sure. And didn't, but the man born blind says, I'm not sure what you're missing here, but Jesus spit in the mud with his saliva, put it in my eyes, sent me to the pool, and now he was miraculously healed. Jesus always uses mud to heal blind people. Blind Bart goes, well, you've got to be mistaken. I interrupted the whole processional in Jericho. I cried out in a loud voice, screaming at him. Jesus never uses blood, mud to heal blind people. He just speaks the word. And they went back and forth and back and forth. And now you know how a second Alliance Church got formed there in there in Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. Not to be tongue-in-cheek, but just imagine, between the Muddites and the anti-Muddites, it's a profound piece of theology. What is the way of healing? Sometimes Jesus uses mud and saliva and washing in a pool. Sometimes he simply speaks the word. 
We have to stop trying to put God in a box and just let him be the master over the problem of pain, the problem of suffering, the problem of why blindness, why mental illness, why cancer, why all the other things that are. So I'm not sure if it's mental, emotional, physical, spiritual, whatever the infirmity that you have, Jesus can miraculously bring about healing. We believe that in the Christian mission life. He's our Savior, and he's our Sanctum, our one makes us holy. But he's also our healer, and he still heals today. It's a profound miracle story. There's one more. It's in John chapter 11. And in John chapter 11, we see it's the story of uh, Jesus and his friend Lazarus. And Jesus was off, and he was kind of in Perea. He was uh, there on um, kind of on holiday. And the word comes to him from Mary and Martha that his good friend Lazarus was sick and dying. Now, when Jesus gets the word, he basically, he stays two more days where he was at. Some kind of friend, right? Your friend is sick and dying. And it's like, oh, he'll be fine. He's going to be fine. And send word back, but Jesus stays there. But then as we see the text, when Jesus comes and, and he is greeted by Mary and by Martha. And Martha first, who says that if you were here uh, and my my brother wouldn't have died. And then later on, we see that Mary says that if you were here, he would have, he would have lived. And we see that it's only one of two times in all of the Gospels that Jesus is recorded in crying. One was at the end when he's entering Jerusalem and he sees uh, on, on that road, he sees the death and destruction of Jerusalem that would take place in 70 A.D. And he says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often have I gathered you as a hen does as a chick, but you would not. And he wept over the death and destruction, not only of that city of God, but of the people, the Jewish people who rejected him. But here, as we look at the text that goes, when the word comes to him, he goes, it says, he was very moved. And it said, uh, come and see, Lord, they replied. And Jesus wept. And the Jews said, see how he loved him. And then what Jesus does is he calls forth and he says, Lazarus, come out. And Lazarus comes out of the tomb, and what Jesus says is, take off the grave clothes. Could you imagine how frightening it would have been to see, see Jesus as the master of life and the master of death, even able to raise the dead? It's a truly a unique miracle story. When we look at the scriptures, and it says in John 20, 30, and 31, that Jesus did many other miraculous signs. In the presence of his disciple, mother, many other miracles. There are many other miracle stories that were performed in the presence of his disciples that are not recorded in this book. But he, I have included these that you might know that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the Living God, and by believing in Him, you might have life in His name. And if and and, and so the whole point of John is life that you might have life in his name, and that you would not miss that. And as we look at this and we see that John has included seven miracle stories, not 40, not 30, or the hundreds that Jesus did, but he did these miracle stories that were included there. Why would he do it? John was an urban pastor and in the city of Ephesus, and people had questions, questions for him. And each one of these miracle stories, I believe, is a way that, that, that John was answering those questions. They had people that are wondering, is this the best route or the best life? Jesus was the master of quality at a Jewish wedding. He turned the water into wine. That some people say, well, I don't feel that God is present and he's distant. And that, that I'm in this part of the world and he's not here. No, he is the master of geography or distance that he could heal the rural official son that was a two-day journey away, that some people had questions, and their questions were about time. And will God ever answer? And, and Jesus is able in an instant immediately to undo 38 long years, 38 long years of this invalid, this paralyzed man, and he was able to heal him. We see that some people have a question, is it ever going to be enough? And Jesus is the master of quantity. He can do more than enough as he feeds the 5,000 and beyond. But we also see that Jesus is the master of all of creation, of nature and the environment, able to walk on the water or to quiet the storm. He is in charge of all. And it doesn't matter what your circumstance, he'll be there. 
and equally as profound, he is the master over suffering, the master of the problem of pain. He is the one that actually can heal the blind man as well as heal blind Bart. And then we look at this last one, that he is the master of life and death. Why did Mark and, why why did John include these? Why did why did the gospel writer have these seven? You notice there's seven, which is um, kind of like the colors of the rainbow: red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. They are like the master, the master of all of creation. Seven. It's or like the turning of a diamond, perfect and complete. See, that's what seven meant in the human mind. It was perfect and complete. So John chooses seven. Jesus did many other miraculous signs, but I choose these seven. These seven are written. You might know that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, that by believing in him, you might have life in his name. The goal of John is life. And my invitation to you today is that you can give your life to Jesus and that he died for you and that that by believing in him, you can have eternal life with him. And for those who have already said yes to him, I believe that you probably have one of these seven questions that uh, the young urban pastor John was facing, questions from his people. And I'm not sure what it is, but whether it's, whether it's quality, whether it, is, it happens to do, to do with geography, whether it happens to do with time, whether quantity, nature, or all of creation, suffering or life and death, Jesus is the answer. I'll be praying for you this week. I trust that over the next seven weeks, we're going to be actually journeying through with a deeper dive into each one of these miraculous signs and wonders and miracle stories. I invite you to journey with me. I'm praying for you. We love you. God bless you. Live this week now as one who is in awe of signs and wonders, miracles of the master through the gospel of John. God bless you. No, no.